All righty, everyone, we're ready to go. Kia ora, welcome. Great to see you all in the morning. Thank you for coming. Um, certainly a mouthful of a title I've got on the screen here, um, and those that know me, and there's a few friendly faces in the room, wouldn't be surprised. I do like to talk about the games industry, so I'll either talk too fast and we'll race through this, or I'll talk too long and go over time. But really just want to spend some time with you all today and talk really about the mindset of thinking and acting like a publisher because we're, many of us are interacting with publishers, many of us are going to be acting like publishers, we may even grow into that. And there's a lot in this space, but it's really about how to think like that. And for those that don't know me, um, that's really been my life. This is coming up to 30 years for me, which uh, is crazy. But I'm not a developer. I've been in the, the publishing space, AAA, indie agency, I've done all of those sort of things. Um, and I'm a nerd. I mean, you can see the photos up there. I absolutely love this industry. It's been my life's work and very happy to keep doing it. So I get up every day thinking like a publisher. And when I joined Exola um, last year, I've had a lot of conversations. I spend most of my time talking to studios, and that's from a solo developer all the way through to larger studios. And I really started to think about, well, what are the common themes that come up in conversation? And for our region, because obviously I'm across the pond, I'm based in Sydney, our, our region here, we don't have a lot of exposure to publishers. We don't have a lot of them here. There are definitely teams doing self-publishing. We do have a handful of the bigger ones, but we don't have the Team 17s and Devolvers of Australia and New Zealand yet. So we're growing into that space. So I think exposure to what publishers want, how they think, what they're looking for, is something we have to go to Gamescom and GDC to learn. Um, so it's really about trying to just pass on some insights, try and think about what it's like on the other side of the table when you're pitching and what that publisher's thinking and what's going through their minds. So, uh, so we want to talk through that. There's quite a lot to get through today, but I firstly want to get to know a little bit more about you. I've talked a, bit, a little bit about me. So how many in the room are working on their first game or first game for a studio? Um, just a show of hands. Yeah, a few of those. Um, how many are looking for publishing? Um, yeah, a few, yeah, few of those. Um, and who actually needs funding for their project? Yep, there's, there's a cohort. Thank you for your marketing survey. Um, that's great, but uh, common theme. I mean, a lot of our region is, is dependent on funding and publishing from outside of this region. So really want to understand and give you some insight what it's like when you're talking to those people and those conversations. So, so now that we've got to know you a little bit, we'll talk about a couple of things. Just a quick setup, obviously, on the state of the industry that we're all operating in. And then really diving into understanding publishers. This is really thinking with my publishing hat on, how do I think when I look at a pitch deck, when I'm looking at a project, and is there something there that can be helpful for you when you're trying to pitch from the other side of the table? And then I want to talk a little bit about pitch. There's obviously lots of talks that talk about how to do the pitch. Uh, some of you may know that Exola has a funding club and it's a platform, it's a free service, but it's a platform where you can submit your games and connect with publishers. It's really just a door opening service, but we see a lot of pitch decks, uh, many, many over the years. So we see commonalities, there are things that come out of that, so I want to share some of those findings. And then the backup plan. Many of us don't end up with a publishing deal and we have to self-publish. So. Let's talk about that. And then just finally, I'm not going to talk too much about Exola today. We've got a booth here. We're upstairs. Come and chat with us. Um, we can learn a little bit more. I joke the elevator pitch takes an hour, so I'm not going to get through it here. But um, we can talk about that later. But in the state of the market, I mean, these numbers should be all pretty familiar, but crazy time. We're already tracking to nearly 15,000 games on Steam this year. If you added mobile, it's, it's in the tens of thousands. It is a competitive space, and it's never been easier to make and release a game, which is fantastic, but it's also never been more competitive. It's so saturated. So getting cut through, becoming that 1% that cuts through is very, very difficult. So it's a noisy market. Um, so the publishers themselves, they're actually at a space now where they're very spoilt for choice. I mean, many of the funds and the venture firms are seeing so many pitch decks that they're really looking for those diamonds in the rough that really have to shine because they just see so many games. So you've really got to do your best to make sure that you cut through that noise and you are one of those top games that they're really looking for. And obviously, from the outside looking in, the industry, the media, everybody tells us how amazing the studios, uh, sorry, the industry is growing, which it is. I mean, we're looking at sort of 6% year on year growth, which is a very healthy industry. But we all know underneath, it's much more nuanced than that. There's a lot going on. We'll see 
stats that players are playing less games more often. We've seen the rise of indie games since lockdowns where that, that's been a nice little bubble for us. So there's a lot of nuance under the hood. It, it's a complicated market and supporting that publishers and investors, it's a roller coaster. I mean, we've obviously seen a very unnatural spike from COVID where the investment in gaming was, was huge. We're probably never going to see that again. But we are seeing positive signs in, in Q1, Q, like Q1, Q2 this year. We've seen some pretty good upside. It's still very conservative out there, um, but it's looking positive. But it's, it's not an easy ride, um, as you would know, if you're out there pitching and talking to teams. So what does that mean for us now? Well, where we are today is it's really not the glory days of 2012 when we were probably talking about five or 6,000 games a year on Steam. And it's not 2022 with that crazy bubble. Um, and it really was crazy. That funding landscape a couple of years ago was, I mean, you had the Web3 crypto funds. There was a lot of money floating around. Interest rates were low. Uh, it's a very, very buoyant market. So there was a couple of glory years, but that has really recalled now and we're feeling that. We're also seeing, obviously, disruptions or distractions from innovation, uncertainty about how we're building, team size, all of these things. So the market is definitely changing and growing. And as I mentioned before, it's, it's that competition. The market is saturated, and that's on the publishing and investment side, but also looking for players. Discoverability is just so difficult now. There are more platforms, there's more opportunity, but getting your game to cut through uh, is really, really challenging. And this makes publishers very nervous. I mean, they, they've got a lot of choice, but they're really not sure what they, need should, what they should be placing their bets on. So what does this mean to you, for all of us? It's really back to the old, old days of conservatism. It's, it's kind of unbridled optimism. I mean, publishers and investors are just being a little bit more cautious. And that, so they're being a little bit slower. And that really comes down to just, they're back to doing a lot more diligence. Those crazy days of Web3, as I mentioned, where you'd, you'd go in with an idea and a pitch um, and you get a couple of million dollars. Uh, those days are gone. Um, so you can expect longer decisions as well. Publishers are just taking longer to decide. They've got more choice. They've got their, their rosters full, so they don't need to rush in and fill out those roadmaps. Um, and then also, you need a stronger business case. I mean, they're looking for you to cut through. What is really going to make your game shine outside of other games that may be the same genre or something like that? So there's a lot of work you've got to do to really make yourself cut through those many, many pitches they're getting. So it's really a return to fundamentals. And certainly being in the industry a long time, I mean, in the early days, there was no such thing as a gaming VC. You had to go to venture capital firms that were traditional. They would put you through a lot of diligence. Uh, there was very, very strict guidelines about how they assess a project. We've had the rise of these gaming venture capital firms, which are fantastic. I mean, the industry needs that. But while the interest rates have been low, that's been a really buoyant space to play. That's definitely recoiled a little bit more now, and firms are sort of going back to that traditional model. So, but what does that all mean when we think about publishers and investors? So I'll dive, dive into that in a second, but I just want to clarify when I say publishers and investors through the talk today, they're interchangeable. I'll, I'll mix them up a little bit. But really, I'm just thinking about those who are putting money into projects, because obviously that they are quite different. But for the purpose of today, we're really just talking about the people who are looking at your project. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide. It, it, it looks really simple, but this is a very fundamental principle. Yes, we are an art business. But it has been a long time since the A in EA is presented as arts. It's always EA games. Um, and we do want to bring our art projects to life. But this is a business. This is a $200 billion business. Uh, it's attracted a lot of money. Publishers and investors are looking as this as a business. So finding that balance, um, and it really is a scale between art and business, is challenging. Um, and certainly, I see we're talking about it this morning, we see the differences even between Australia and New Zealand. You have a very commercially savvy industry over here that comes from your trade and your government commissions, groups like Code, there's, there's a lot of great support here where you're really driving the business side. Whereas in Australia, uh, there is a focus on arts, on grants and things like that. It's a little bit less about the commercial side, but this is a business and we really need to present that way. So. So publishers are looking for a business opportunity and when they're sitting across from you on the table with that pitch deck, that is what is going through their mind. And really thinking about what's going through their mind 
this is really what it is. I mean, they're talking about things, so they're having inner dialogue about product market fit. Where's your game going to fit? What sort of terms are going to make sense for a deal with your studio? A big one is the security. Will you hit your milestones? Will you deliver this game? That is a big consideration for, for a publisher or an investor. Is there a release window? I mean, they, they've, they've got to think about their slate, where your game might fit. Is there a gap? And then, of course, risk, return, profit. They're thinking very business-minded. So this is the first things that are going through their mind when they're looking at that project. Comparison to you, you're thinking about money. I mean, you're thinking about marketing, QA, how am I going to get this project finished? All of these things here. And these are all important, but they're also very operational. And if you're really looking at this, as what are they think? what's the publisher thinking about? What are you thinking about across the table? The alignment's really the profit and success at the bottom. And yes, all of the things you need are going to come into those conversations. But they're going to come into conversation at the time where the publisher is confident with the other things they're thinking about. Is this, is this project attractive? Can this team deliver? So really, the goal in those early stages when talking to publishers is about getting the language aligned. Are you talking the same thing? So really, you want to go through that process of, of hitting some of those things they're thinking about early so they can say, look, I'm curious. I want this project. I want to know more. Then we can start talking about well, what's needed to deliver it and think about the operational side. And how are they really thinking? They're basically playing poker. I mean, they're running a business, but I'll put some caveats here. This is a mythical publisher, mythical numbers, all of these things. But as an illustration, this is probably not uncommon in the indie space. You would see something like a development budget is 500,000 US. And then if you considered some marketing, some operations, the cost the publisher's putting in, it's not uncommon that the total cost for that publisher is about a million dollars for that project. So if they're putting that on Steam, I mean, call it $40, they're making $28 a unit, immediately they're sizing up your project and saying, am I, making, am I going to break even? I'm going to make that million dollars back, or am I 3xing, 5xing, 10xing? They're looking at this as a business proposal, and that's exactly what's running through their head. So that's the first thing they're thinking about before they dive too deep. And for them, they're then thinking about a portfolio strategy. And again, this is mythical, but this is not uncommon that a publisher says, we're putting roughly a million dollars into a project. We'd ideally like to release 10, 12 games a year, so call that, call that one a month. Um, they're putting in $12 million into their fund, into their portfolio for that year. They know, and these numbers are quite scary, but 70% of those games are unlikely to even break even. Most of them, this is a hit-driven business. Most of those games won't make their money back. They're looking for a couple of those that are going to break even or make a little bit of profit, and they're looking for those unicorns that are going to pay for the whole 12. And yes, of course, this publisher's got potentially a back catalogue and they're living off the tail of titles from previous years. But they're often really thinking about where are you in that bet? Are you one of those seven games that's not going to make it? Of course, they want all their games to work, but just they know statistically many of them won't. So it really is a game of poker. And this look like my great. I mean, they've, they've put those 12 games in. They've, they've made $25 million, 50% rev, gross margin. That looks fantastic. But once they start paying out your royalties, they're already down. And this is, just, this is a very basic model. There's a lot more cost to this. Call that 27%. I know in the publishing world, they're looking to make 40, 70% margin. So this is a very risky business for them. So they're placing their bets. And right now, with the conservatives in the market, they're really not sure how to pick the winners. So they're doing the due diligence. They're going deeper. And they're really just thinking about those bets with that spoil for choice. So. But rather than focus completely on how tough it is, and we know how tough it is, they do invest. Um, there is positivity, as I said, we're, we're seeing some uptick. So when do they invest? It's a couple of things. One, when they believe there's an audience. And this is critical. We're very rarely launching a game and building a new audience. We would love to do that. And yes, the industry is growing. But typically, we're stealing audience from another game. So they've got to believe that your project is going to steal the, that game. How are you going to pull? a bunch of mates playing Apex Legends for two hours every night that they do three times a week, and it's actually a behavior. How do you change that and pull them across to your game? So they're looking for that belief in audience, and they're also looking belief, I mentioned it before, that you can ship that game. And this is particularly important for those studios doing first game, first studio. That's 
a high risk factor for a publisher. Um, you're unproven. And it can even be that you have some great developers that have worked on amazing projects that have come together, but have you shipped a game together? Because that doesn't always work, just putting the, the team together. So they're really looking for this belief, and belief there is something you're convincing them. None of us really know. Um, that That's your vision that you've got to deliver and convince them. But this is really important that you're getting that perception that your, your product or your project is going to cut through. And I've generalised here a little bit. The publishers and investors, they are all quite different. Um, there is nuance. I, I've made some assumptions here. But that is important to know because I do talk to a lot of teams and I say, who's your dream publisher? And I get a lot of blank faces. So I'm not really sure. Have you got a top 10? You really need to think about those publishers that might be the right fit for you as well because they do have their considerations. And that, that could be a focus on genre, uh, maybe some in particular on genre. Some have a certain size, maybe they have a cap in how much they invest, um, and there's limits. So you really need to do some homework there. Um, they all have different models. I mean, <laughs> they're all challenging <laughs> models. They've got to make money, they've got a risky business, but you really want to understand that model as well. Um, they are very different. And then also keep in mind that you can have an amazing game, but it's just not right for them. And it's nothing to do with the project. It just could be that they've already got three roguelike games for the next two years, and you're presenting another roguelike game. And it's nothing to do with that your project isn't a good fit. It just doesn't fit their model and what they're looking for. So keep that in mind as well. So I just want to talk a little bit. That's We've talked a little bit about the thoughts of what a publisher is thinking about. It's just something to keep in mind that this is what's going through their head. And then when you're sitting down with them, you're typically running through your deck. And keep that in mind, because this is what they're looking for from those decks. How do they answer those questions that came up early? The product market fit, the audience, your capabilities. Because this is also a simple slide, but something that comes up, and again, something we see from the Exola Funding Club. We see a lot of decks that I say, that's a product deck. It's not a pitch deck. And that product deck is full of amazing information about the game, core loops, all of the things we need to see. And we'll talk about that. You definitely need that information. But the publisher's looking for that commercial viability. What is the business pitch? You, you're a small business owner sitting down with them, putting a, an investment opportunity on, in front of them. So you've really got to think about, does it have the right elements for that to include and what they're looking for in those early decision stages? So, so it's also really important that with your pitch deck, you've got to think about your audience. The audience is that publisher or investor. It's not the game developer you, or game player. You are not trying to persuade them to play your game. Of course, they want to see a demo. They want to see the game in action. They are going to make an assessment. But they're thinking about a business decision. You're, in providing, you're, you're persuading them to invest. This, this is a proposal. This is something you're sitting down. So they want to see the confidence from you that you've thought through your project. You know where it sits in the market and what you're trying to achieve. And you should also, with your pitch deck, have the aim of what you want to achieve. And certainly in those early stages, your aim is to get conversations going. You're going to Gamescom, you're going GDC, you're here, you're getting your deck out as wide and far as you can go. You want people to be talking about your game. And the industry's big, but it's also very small and connected as well. So games that are out in the, in the sort of stratosphere that are getting noticed do get talked about between publishers, between groups at events like this. There are definitely projects that rise to the surface. So you want to be in that conversation, and you want to make it really hard for them to say no. You're sparking curiosity. They've got 15,000 Steam games coming down the line. What's going to be really interesting on your project? They go, I really need to find out more about that project. So, and this is really an exercise in you building confidence as you go through that pitch. Um, you're sitting there with an investment deal. They're looking for the confidence in you that you know how to present your business side of, of what you're presenting. So we'll talk a little bit about pitching and what to include. And I mean, there are many talks out there about the perfect pitch deck. I've pitched myself. I've got side hustles. I know all this sort of thing. It's, it's, there is no perfect pitch deck. Um, you need to deliver your vision and tone. But there are certainly things that we'll talk through some of these that are commonalities. There are things from the funding club that we see that are missing in many of those kind of product versus pitch decks that we want to talk through. So I just want to go through a couple of highlights in some of these areas, just, just to get you thinking about things that, from that publishing mindset, what they're looking for. So firstly, the elevator pitch. Can't stress how important this one is. It doesn't happen so much now, but I don't know how many games in the past I looked at two screenshots, a title, and a single line, and just called a number of units and said, yep, that'll do. 
75,000 to 225,000 years and $40. That's the price. And I didn't even read any further. That was it. Now, that's not exactly how it works now, but concisely getting together curiosity and a summation of what your game delivers on is really, really important. It's not actually that easy. I mean, marketers spend a lot of time crafting their pitch decks, crafting that elevator pitch. A Nike just do it. They spend a lot of time. It seems really simple. but. Coming to a conclusion like that that sums up what they stand for and what the, the project vision is is not easy, but it's very, very important. Because what you want to avoid is this kind of thing. It's just hitting the publisher with a wall of, of text, all of this sort of thing. And this law is amazing. I mean, you've spent a lot of time. This is very important to the game. But deeper in the conversation, once those publishers and investors have got through the curiosity, they're very interested in your project, they will want to learn much more about the law. But right now, they're just looking for that thing that's going to spark instantaneously and, and cut you through those 15,000 games. And then the next stage, unique selling points. And this one's really interesting as well, because there's a few things that you need to include. Of course, you need to include core game loop. That should be critical. There should be a thesis of what you're trying to do. Are you doubling down on a particular mechanic for a Souls-like game? Is there something that's a fusion of a hybrid of two genres, something that's really important that should stand out for your game? That's obviously front and center. But the next one is really important as what makes this game different. And we see a lot, I'll show some examples here, but it's very easy with unique selling points to be very generic. And you've got to really avoid generic because it just places you in a bucket with a lot of other games. And it's a tricky one. It, you can almost think about, if you come up with a unique selling point, you almost sort of reversed it. If it doesn't describe another game exactly, it's just generic. It's just something that can, can serve us for any game. And, and the last thing is, why would people play this game? I talked about this before. You're stealing market share from another game. You're stealing audience attention not just from games, but from Netflix, from many other things that people are doing in their leisure time. So it's really got to be compelling to bring them across. So these three things are really important in those early stages of the pitching deck. And just some of those bad examples. I mean, we, we see them all the time, inspiring gameplay, amazing graphics. I mean, every game wants that. Nobody really wants average graphics or dull. So try and avoid generic in your terms. Try and find something that lines to your thesis of the core loop and what really sets you apart. And then product market fit. This was one of the things I, I mentioned that publishers are thinking about early. Um, this is really important. So this is quite a good example. And this doesn't have to be a perfect example. You don't need to be finding up here on, on the left a, a gap in the market, something that the games on the market haven't done. That, that could be a great thesis. But you could be doubling down on Call of Duty and saying we're really going to do something that they do poorly or something we think we can iterate better. But you want to be really clear on where you think you fit in the market. And what you're trying to avoid is the we're everything to everybody. I mean, it, it, we'd love to talk to all players. We love our games to have all aspects of everything. But it's really difficult to be that space. You, you want to find what from your thesis, what from your unique selling points are you really doubling down on and really hone in on that. So that's your product market fit. The next thing I want to touch on, and this is a really important distinction between where we see those product decks versus pitch decks, is what to include in title comparisons. Where, do you, where is your game or your project going to sit in the market? And that's really important to align in something that makes sense, games that are similar to your title. And this is really important to lay this out. And again, in the process of building trust with, with publishers, they want to see that you understand your project. You don't want to let them think about, well, I've got a roguelike game, what is a comparison title? They might come to their own conclusion that, no, there's too many of those, the market potential is not that high. If you've done the homework and really sat down and laid out in your deck, this is the games that fit against our game, this is where we're benchmarking, you're actually leading the conversation and showing confidence in your project. And that's going to go a long way because they may just come along and say, you know what? You've done the homework. Yeah, OK, maybe you're 10% off here or there. But I actually agree with where you're positioning on the project. And that might really help you get through that conversation because you're leading it and building trust and confidence. Uh, and of course, you've got to back that up with sales because they want to look at where is the opportunity. And you don't have to be the world's biggest game. You just need to be confident with where you think you benchmark against. And to that point, you want to really show a spectrum. I mean, you want to show games in your genre or what you're benchmarking against, games that may be at the bottom end of the scale. 
I mean, there's some, some crazy statistics that 90% of games on Steam make less than $4,000. And yes, there are game jams and passion projects and things like that, but there are a lot of games that don't make a lot of money. And then, of course, what's the top end? And then be realistic. Where does your game fit on this spectrum? And you don't have to be hitting that 2.3 million if you're only shooting for 350, but be really confident that you, you can get to that 350. You're not convincing them that you can get to 2.3. You're convincing them that you fit and are well aligned with that 350 if that's where you've chosen. So lead that conversation. And there's a lot of there's a lot of resources, Steam Spy, Steam DB. I mean, on mobile side, there's a lot of analytics platforms as well that can help you get to this conclusion. But lay this out for the, the publisher or investor. Let them know where you think you're going to land. It's going to be really important. Um, and this is really not the example. You're not chasing Elden Ring on a $500,000 budget. So that's just going to show naivety in your understanding of your product market fit. So be really spend the time in your deck to really understand where your game's going to fit. And then traction and progress. So what do I mean by that? This is really just a catch-all for everything you've got along the way. No matter where you are in the project journey, if you're talking to publishers and investors, collect and gather awards, accolades, grants, positive social posts, anything you can do that can help support that because you're still convincing them that you can deliver on the game, you're convincing them that there's an audience, this is gonna help convince on the audience that there's a demand. So all of these things are gonna be helpful. And then I'm not gonna to talk too much about this slide. There's a lot of things here that are very obvious, very operational. As I said, there's no perfect pitch deck, but obviously these things are important. But the big ones out of this is the timeline. And this is going to be pretty familiar. I'm not going to spend too much time on here. But again, seeing a lot of pitch decks from the funding club, don't forget about post-launch. See a lot of pitches that come through the last milestones launch. The last tranche is going to be, that's going to be the last time you're probably paid. But you will know post-launch is going to be that at least bug patch that comes in very quick. All the, all the major fixes you've got to do really quickly. You could have post-sales. You could have activity for the next 12 months that the publisher is expecting you to do things with. Even if your game's a hit, you might not be seeing royalty checks for some time, sometimes even 14 months, 18 months. So don't forget that post-launch, you need money. You've got to pay salaries, wages. You've got to do that, that, that bug fix. And it's often forget that you'll see the timeline and it literally stops, like I just showed it, at that release date. So, so keep that in mind because, again, you're, you're asking this is a business plan and you're not you're expecting to go way past launch so just just be mindful of that and similarly with the budget be really bold in your budget I mean locally here our imposter syndrome our tall poppy syndrome we're all doing all right we don't like to ask for money it's really interesting when even I go to the US studios and conversations will get straight down to money how much are we gonna make what are we gonna do what do we need here it's like yeah we're doing all right we need a little bit of money but be really bold in what you need. Don't, don't be shy in asking. This, this is a business plan. It's not emotional for the publisher and investor. They're looking at that number. They're sizing that 585. Does that seem reasonable for the competitive analysis? How many units do you think you're going to sell? They're not going to squabble over, is that 585, is that 625? In, in our world, that 50K might be significant. But in their world, that's not the decider. Um, yes, there are publishers that might have a hard stop at 500 or a million. They're going to tell you that, and they're not going to look at a project they're interested in and say, look, you're 85K over the 500 that we invest in, we're out. They're going to have a conversation and say, look, we do have a cap. You can say, look, we, can, we could probably shave 85 and come back. But be confident in what you're really going for, and that includes your post-launch. And the other thing to keep in mind is we do see some decks where they'll have options. If we had this much money, we'll do this. If we have this much money, we'll do this. I don't know. There, there's different schools of thought, but I would think you're better to go front and center with what do you want. You can have that conversation with them. If they're generally interested, you can talk about those sort of things and say, look, if we had an extra money, we could do some DLC, those kinds of things. So, uh, so just keep going focused on what you need to succeed. You can always adjust this. You can always have a conversation with them. But this is just a decision on an, on an investment. It's not as emotional for them as it is for you. So don't forget your team, of course. So who you are, what you've worked on. And as I mentioned before, just because you've got a great team of people who may have worked on some amazing AAA projects doesn't always mean they gel as a team. Um, I'm a musician. When you're in a band, there's kind of a 
a kind of a, a telepathic kind of symbiotic relationship that you build and it's the same in game development not all people work together so but always be front and center on what everyone's worked on that's going to be an accolade for you uh, and that is and really explain why you're the best team to build this game you're convincing them you'll hit those milestones you're convincing them you can deliver you can understand the thesis and deliver on that so make sure that's in there as well and then of course you need to qualify them. I talked about this before. Who's your dream publisher? Uh, have you got your top 10? This is like a marriage, and it certainly is like a marriage sometimes. <laughs> Those contracts are complicated. So you really want to do the homework. And of course, sometimes you don't have the choice. Somebody's offering you money, you need the publishing deal, your runway's running out. Do you get, are you going to take that deal? But going with the wrong publisher can be just as damaging as, as not going with a publisher at all. So just keep in some of the minds and ask them, what are their strengths? Do they focus on a certain genre? Is it aligned? Why is this game going to work for them? Does it fit with their catalog? Um, what will they be paying for? Of course, those operational costs, they all do different things. But also keep in mind, do you have an a say in it? I mean, sometimes the publisher will say, great, we're giving you this money for development. We'll do everything else. And that million dollars on the books of what your project's worth starts creeping up and up. They've put marketing costs, they've put flights to, to this event, things like that. They're all, a portion of that's going to your bottom line and you've got to pay that back in royalties. Uh, you don't always have the upper hand to control that, but hopefully you've got some transparency and you can see what's being charged there. Did they really spend that money on IGN marketing? Are those things happening? So you want some visibility. So talk that through with them. Um, what are their terms? Of course, this is really important. They do vary a lot. Um, some, particularly in the indie space, it's really much, it's kind of a distribution and marketing deal. Some, it really is a deep relationship that they're investing early in publishing. Um, and then also make sure you know what they need beyond the pitch. What comes next? What's the follow up? Again, try and lead that as much as you can so you know exactly where the conversation needs to go because they're seeing all those decks, they're coming out of a show, they've got 200 companies they've spoken to, they're trying to remember five or ten that go, oh, that's the one I need to follow up. So make sure you know what the next stage is. Um, so then, on to the third part, which I want to talk about, your plan B. Unfortunately, many of us do need a plan B. And why do we need that plan B? Is because most pitches just don't land. Publishers are so sport for choice, a lot of those pitches won't get you a deal. And then even if you get through and you're talking to them, Many of them don't get signed, so that is a narrow margin. So not by choice, many projects and studios are going to end up self-publishing. And the last thing you want to do is you build a game for two or three years, you put blood, sweat and tears into it, and you just throw it on Steam and see what happens. It is not a build it and they will come market. Discoverability is too hard. So no matter what you're doing, if you're, if you're self-publishing, you've got to think about how you can put effort into that. And look. It's hard, I get it, we hear it all the time, publishing's hard, we're a dev team, we're builders, we don't have the resource or time to do this, we don't have the money, we don't know what, how to do marketing, but you actually do have some tools. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because my background's publishing and marketing and look, when you come from AAA you do have a lot of resource, but what can you do that is practical and what, what can you sort of hack together? And, and it is challenging, but it's, it's really about putting some time and commitment to it because the basic principles are pretty straightforward. You have to find your audience. We talked about that before. Who's going to play this game? Where are you stealing that market share from? You've got to get your assets and all of your messaging in front of them. And then it's kind of rinse and repeat. You're raising awareness, you're amplifying, you're finding audience. So it's fairly simplistic and you actually can do this, um, even if it's a very basic level. Um, and realistically, a lot of studios think, well, once a publisher comes on board, they'll just take care of all of this. But I would argue that finding your audience and aligning assets is something you do anyway, especially if you've announced your game and you don't have a deal, and you're building Discord, you're building communities, you've already got a direct relationship with the customers. You're already talking about your game and selling your product. They can come in and help that third stage, that amplification and awareness, but you're doing a lot of that early stage. So make sure you're really thinking and committing to doing that from, from the get-go. It's not something you throw in at the end of development. It really needs to run in parallel. Um, so why would you do that, though? Why, why would you try and build this audience? You need that direct relationship. In the games industry, having a relationship directly to players is probably the most powerful asset you can ever have. 
And certainly through my career, we never had this. It was the big publishers that had this. That's why you went to them. But now with Discord and socials, you've got so much way to talk to your direct players, and that's so powerful. Um, you want to avoid spray and pray marketing. If you don't know who your audience is, you don't know who to target. It's finding similar players. You've got to understand which players are going to play and respond to your game. And they will give you that feedback on the health of your game. Is this resonating? And then data. I mean, data we could talk about all day, but the big publishers obviously want to know their audience because that data is really powerful. So obviously, if you're an indie studio, that's challenging. Um, but what can you do? What do you want to know about that audience? You want to know where they came from. Did they come from Discord? Did they come from social? How did you find that player? Can you find more like that? What influences their decision? Did they come through word of mouth? Was it a streamer? Was it an IGN review or a preview? You want to know what they play. You might have a thesis that you want to build a Switch version as well as PC, but do you, is it just a hunch, or do you know they actually want that? Have you done any research on whether the Switch port's going to work? Is there an audience for it? And you can actually ask them. You can do a MailChimp survey. There are ways you can talk to your audience, uh, even in a simplistic level, and find out whether that's going to resonate. And then that will give in, and inform what the platform preferences are. Do they want that version? And then CRM data, it's kind of a scary term. The big companies have this. They use customer relationship management to know about their customer. It helps them with marketing. It is, it is a deep rabbit hole, and it's very challenging for an indie. But you can still kind of hack that together. You've got tools. You've got I mentioned MailChimp, email, social, you can run polls, surveys, Discord. There's a lot of powerful things you can do yourself to understand your audience and, and, and sort of build that your own version of that customer relationship. So even as simple as some tags and tracking pixels, I mean, you, if you go into MailChimp, you can set up a, a welcome newsletter or you can do something like send out a survey and it'll bring back, you could ask them, well, which versions are you most interested? PC, Steam, PlayStation, they tick the box. And then in your back end, they've got a tick for PlayStation. So the next time you send an email, if you want to send an email to targeting your PlayStation customers, you've already got a little cohort that's done. So there are things you can do. Um, you can hack it together. And the second stage of that marketing is aligning assets. And this, I mean, there's a lot on here, but these are really similar to your, your release schedule. These are just the beats of launch. You're trying to build momentum. So think about from the start of every stage of development, what are you building? Did you create a new screenshot? Did you come up with a logo? Was there a new character art? Was there a new environment? What can the development side give to the marketing side, even if that's the same people, that you can use and promote? And it could be as simple as building little TikToks. You want to do that all the way along. And it may even feel like the first six months, nine months, that not much is really happening. You're putting these TikTok videos out. You're putting out social, you're not really getting much. But you're trying to build momentum. And it does eventually pay off. SEO systems kick in. Google starts picking up uh, all of this asset. You start building momentum. And this is really something that you just need to put a commitment in there. It's not complicated. Uh, it's just something you need to, to consistently do. And this is not just for the AAAs as well. There's a lot of debate about, well, do indie gamers respond differently to different kinds of marketing? We've certainly seen through COVID, and there's a lot of studies now, that indie gamers typically are just high-consuming AAA gamers. Yes, they play their Call of Duty, they have their, their regular behaviours, but when they have downtime, they want to consume, highly consume, and we saw that in COVID, they were highly consuming indie. And this has really opened up now, we're getting a lot more indie games that they're sort of bite-sized, taking that on, playing seven hours, eight hours, whatever the game is, and then they go back to their regular behaviours. But that consumption's really high, so they respond to this type of marketing. Um, it's something to keep in mind. Um, and then that amplification, as I said, it's really about just staying focused and persistent. You want to keep this running through your, that whole development cycle. Do as much as you can. And those things can be simple. As I said, use those tags and surveys in MailChimp. The other one is set up a welcome email. How many game sites do you go to and it's join our newsletter and you send it in and it goes to an abyss and you never hear anything and then you get an email two days before launch. Um, you can set up an automated email that says, welcome, thank you, joining, Please let us know what you're interested in. Click here to get, I don't know, a special skin. Tell us about your experience. Join our Discord. Make sure you're driving them to some sort of action. It doesn't need to take you a lot of time, even if you're a small team. Um, and then paid media. I hear a lot of negativity. Paid media doesn't work. We're too small. We don't have a big enough budget. We put money on Google and Facebook. Doesn't necessarily work. It is challenging. It does take time to build up those campaigns. But it can be as simple as you had an organic post on social that the engagement blew up. Just put $50 on it. Just boost it. Just dark post it. 
that is paid media. You're boosting, boosting posts that are already working. So there are simple things you can do as an indie that still work. And then think about all the online festivals. Many of you do this, this is probably familiar, but not just Steam Next Fest, there are many, many festivals out there you can, you can connect. You can build a calendar of all of these, they're all free organic marketing. Yes, they take some time and some submissions and all those things, but you can definitely work through those uh, and get out to some of these. And then, where can you provide incentives? So, like that welcome newsletter, do you have any action you can drive? Can you give away a skin to join a news list? Is there something you can incentivize? So there's a lot there, obviously, in self-publishing. Couple of tips, there are things you can do. So that sort of leads me just, as we sort of get close to wrapping up, what exactly can Exola do? I'm not gonna go into the elevator pitch that takes an hour, but I mentioned the funding club a couple of times. This is something people do know from us. It's a free marketplace. You submit your game. We have 250 publishers and investors. It's basically a door opener and scouting service. So come talk to us about that. And then the rest of Exola, it's more than just payments. This is our vision board, I call it. We have a lot of tools. We're doing direct-to-consumer marketing, back-end. I could go on, 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 on. So come talk to us about that. So we're definitely talking to studios from solo developers all the way to big partners. And there's a lot of things we can help you with on your journey. So in conclusion, everything we've really talked today, this is First principles, think about the publisher. They are thinking about a business case. So build that business case, get those conversations going. And yes, pitching and publishing is certainly hard, it's certainly nuanced, but if you can build a game, you can do marketing. It is not that complicated, it's just that persistence and just following that through your project. So that's really the conclusion I wanted to get across, just, just thinking like that. And then, oh, bonus tip, <laughs> little pet peeve. Please make sure on your website that you've got links to Steam or wherever your game's available. I don't know how many games company sites I go to. I'm trying to click, how do I wish list, how do I join that? So again, just like the welcome newsletter, be mindful of where you're driving those people. That could be a sign up that was missed just coming to your page. So uh, I can't stop thinking like a publisher, it's just, just how I operate. So hope that was helpful. Hope there's some insights there about putting on the other side of the table. And just lastly to finish up, there are great resources in this industry. Again, I wish we had all of these years ago. So indie game business who have an amazing database of all those publishers. So if you're trying to find your dream publisher, gamediscover.co, Simon Carlos does amazing insights into Steam breakdowns, how to market a game. Chris does amazing podcasts and, and, and blogs and booklets. And then Deconstructor of Fun, they give you the, the summary every week. You can listen to the podcast um, and tell you all about what's happening in the news. And these things are really important because this is what the publishers are thinking about. So thank you very much. Hope that was helpful. Thank you.